talking about rhythm, and we have discussed rhythm in several different ways. We discuss rhythm through prayer, through fasting. We discuss rhythm through giving, community, evangelism. And rhythm is something that's actually very, very vital and important. If your body doesn't have a rhythm or doesn't operate in a certain way, you die. Machines have a rhythm the way nature has a rhythm. It's called seasons. And yet another rhythm that's to be added to the individual Christian is the rhythm of Sabbath. Sabbath. And I have to be honest with you. I thought that I truly understood what it meant concerning Sabbath. But when I started really delving into it, I realized I did not understand Sabbath as much as I thought that I did. And so I want to share with you as your pastor, some people say, well, that's Old Testament. That I, it, it is mentioned in the Old Testament. We don't understand exactly what Sabbath is because there's a, there's, there's a lot of confusion in this area. So go with me to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, reading the first three verses. You there? So the creation of the heavens and earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, somebody say seven, that's the day of completion, God finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day, and he declared it to be holy, because it was the day that he rested from the work of creation. So we find in the creation of the earth, in chapter one, that God places a man on the earth, and then he declares the seventh day holy, and he rested. Now, God rested not because he was tired. God is what is called omnipotent, meaning all-powerful. God rested, and that's an unfortunate word because when it's translated into English, because when you actually look closer to that and you do a depth study on it, it's real, the word ceased. It says on the seventh day, God ceased from his work. What was his work? Creation. So in six days, God did creation, and on the seventh day, he ceased from the work of doing creation, which makes a lot more sense when you take a look at it. It was nothing more than him just stopping and creating anything else, because he had made it complete. Everything that was made was made in that period of time. It was a boxed in a specific period of time. In, first, in Colossians 1, 15 and 17, the 17th verse says, he existed before anything else, that's God, and he holds all creation together. God holds all creation together, so follow me. Colossians said that God existed, Jesus existed before anything was created. He was, he was the firstborn, he was the first, he was the first to be there to, to create all things. He holds, God holds everything together, which means if God just simply rested and kicked back, and decided to kick back and do nothing, everything would fly apart. Amen. Everything would be in chaos. Because if God had total disregard for what he created and did a hands off and just kick back. I mean, think about how we think about resting. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to lift a hand. I have nothing to do with it. Well, if God did that to his creation, there'd be nothing left. So God did not kick back and rest from his creation. He just simply ceased to do any more creating. Very, very important that we see that because if God created me, and he did, and he created you, and he did, and he is the one that holds us together, you and I need to have a lot of, lot of strength in knowing the fact that no matter what happens in our life, no matter what goes on with us, God holds us together. No matter what kind of battle you're going through, no matter what kind of heartache you're going through, no matter what kind of shortage, no matter what kind of loss, no matter how you're, how you're doing physically, financially, emotionally, God holds you together. And God holds you and I together by his love. We can't earn it. We can't be good enough. We can't pay the price that would take for him to hold everything together. He just simply does it because he loves us. Somebody say a good Amen. So from Genesis 2, 3, we see that he rested. Now this word rested that you see, the original Hebrew word is Shabbat. And Shabbat means to cease. So the Shabbat or the Sabbath is the day of ceasing to work. 
Please keep that in mind. God set a pattern that on Sabbath that there was a ceasing to work. Now, a little history. From the time of creation to the time that Moses received the Ten Commandments from God was a little over 2,500 years, timeline-wise. From the time God says the Sabbath is a good day, the seventh day is a holy day, it's a good thing, to the time that Moses gets the tablets and says that we should remember the Sabbath and keep it holy is 2,500 years. Other words, there was nothing written for 2,500 years. See what I'm saying? Till God gave the commandments. It was just recognized and passed down by people that God sees this as a special day. And when he did give the commandments for the Sabbath, it was very, very, very simple. Keep the Sabbath, remember the Sabbath, and keep it holy, period. There weren't all these restrictions. It took man in the time to follow that to come up with 39 restrictions to be added to that one phrase. God didn't put them in there, but man, the Pharisees, added in the Talmud 39 additional restrictions of what you, and they got so specific that the Talmud taught the things that were prohibited that you could do on the Sabbath. Now the Ten Commandments just said, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. But the Jewish people, the leaders, the, the, the Pharisees said, I think we're going to help God out. So man helped God out and added 39 things you could not do to remember the Sabbath. God did not have that written down. God did not tell them. They did it on their own. So what were some of these things that, that were written? Well, no sowing, no plowing, no reaping, no grinding, no baking, no shearing, no dyeing of wool, no sowing, no trapping, no tanning, no building, no demolishing, no putting on a fire, no putting out a fire, and a whole bunch of more other things. In other words, Anything that resembled work, you could not do on the Sabbath. Now, when you back up and you see that the, the, the Sabbath is the fourth commandment, the Ten Commandments are divided into two categories. The first four have to do with man's relationship with God, or how a man honors God. Do you understand that? No other gods before me, don't worship idols. Don't take my name in vain and keep the Sabbath day because it's holy. That's got my relationship with God. The other six had to do with man's relationship with fellow man. No stealing, no lying, no cheating, no committing adultery, no coveting. These were all the things that we had a relationship with each other that we're, we're to exercise towards each other. But in the relationship of the Ten Commandments where it's my relationship with God, he just simply says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And keep it holy. So the Jewish people kept it holy in the way they thought it should be done. And they made a precise time of Sabbath. They considered the seventh day of the week the time that is from sunset Friday to sunset Saturday. is considered Sabbath by the Jewish people. In time... It got more complicated, and it became more of a burden to remember, can I do this? Can I do oh, this? I can't do this. I can't even go do this. I can't light a fire to do my food. I can't do whatever. I can't, I can't walk very far, because if I walk very far, I'll sweat. And if I sweat, I'm breaking, the, I'm breaking a commandment. I mean, literally, if you broke a sweat, you broke a commandment. Because you weren't allowed to sweat. Because it would be considered a type of work. And you say, oh, that's crazy, Pastor. I mean, nobody does that anymore. Really? I found an article, March 22nd, 2015. ABC News reported an article from the Associated Press written by a, a man by the name of Michael Balsamo. And here it is. I'm going to read it to you. A Brooklyn father came home to his worst nightmare to find his house filled with fire that had killed seven of his eight children and critically burned his wife and surviving child. This is a tragedy, folks. This is a real event. The house itself was a total loss. The cause of fire was determined to be the use of a malfunctioning hot plate. It sparked a fire which rapidly spread through the stairs, trapping the children in the bedrooms. The Sassoon family, members of an Orthodox Jewish community, moved to Brooklyn 
less than two years prior to this. The obvious question you might ask is, why was a hot plate left on while the family was sleeping? ABC News reported, the hot plate was left on for the Sabbath, which lasts from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. They report that many religious Jews rise Use, when any religious Jews, excuse me, use one to keep food warm, obeying the tradition that prohibits them to use a fire on the Sabbath, as well as all forms of work, which includes turning on appliances. And as a result of the tragedy, the Orthodox community around the world is now reconsidering the practice of keeping a hot plate. In other words, whether or not they will even let them use a hot plate anymore. So the Ten Commandments were so hard, and the pro prohibitions, the, the, the things that they were prohibited to do because of the Sabbath became such a big heaviness, uh, such a burden on the people, that it forced people to do two things. The first thing that the law forced people to do, because no man could keep the Ten Commandments. No man could live successfully day in and day out all their life without breaking a commandment. Romans tells us that. The Ten Commandments was a, a shadow. It was, it, was a, it was a guideline of what sin was so that we know what sin is. So, you know, it's, it's hard to repent of something if you don't know what you did as a sin. So the Ten Commandments pointed out what sin was. But when they added all these special laws to the original law of simply remember and keep it holy, it became such a burden to the people that they do one of two things. They look for loopholes to get around it, and that's what they did there. They plugged in the hot plate before the Sabbath. It kept the food warm, which kept them from having to turn on the appliance, turn off the appliance, make a fire, put out a fire, and just let it run. You see, the bottom line is, even if it malfunctioned, and they were standing there while it malfunctioned, they couldn't unplug it because of the Sabbath. If it would have sparked a fire, they couldn't unplug it, because unplugging it, would have been considered work. How many agree with me? It's hard to live that way. So the idea of the Sabbath was supposed to be to honor God. And there were some things that people did to honor God. Let me give you a couple examples I thought were cool. The Jewish people teach that one of the ways you can honor God on the Sabbath is by spending time a temple with your immediate family. It also teaches that, that another way that you can honor God is just spending time with your immediate family other than temple also. They encourage people to show hospitality, invite people over and share time together to get to know people, to love people, to encourage people. One of the things that was encouraged by the people at the temple concerning Sabbath and the Jewish tradition is they said that you need to get together and sing spiritual songs. It, prevents, it causes a joy and a, and a closeness with each other. Then finally, they were encouraged to read and study Scripture together, the Torah. See, all these things we can say, yeah, big yeah to. So on one hand, the Sabbath, you were encouraged to do all these good things. And it's, by the way, it's a lot of the things we're doing this morning, right? But on the other hand, you broke the Sabbath because you, you could not drive your car here this morning. You're only restricted to go so many cubits in any walking distance away from your home. You could not have prepared a major breakfast this morning if you used any type of utensil. As you can see, it was a burden, a very big burden on people. A time we're supposed to honor God. So what did Jesus say about the Sabbath? This is interesting when I study this out. Jesus, Matthew 12, 8 says, For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, Jesus is the ruler of the Sabbath. In other words, the laws of the Sabbath that God made came from Jesus himself. Now, the rest of these rules that were made up by the Pharisees, they didn't come from Jesus. And they're the ones that were the heavy burden on the people. So the burden of the Sabbath, which was only supposed to be to honor and keep holy a day for God, actually became something much, much more that nobody could keep. 
it says in Mark 2, 27, Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man and man was not made for the Sabbath. So when you see the Sabbath, Jesus says, I want you to know the Sabbath was made for you. You were not made to serve the Sabbath. And he pointed out a story after Jesus had been going through the fields and walking along the fields and his guys got hungry on the Sabbath and they broke off the tops of some grain and they meshed it together and ate it and, and the Pharisees said, aha, they don't even keep the law. These are not good men. These are not holy men. They're working. They're harvesting. So Jesus is looking at them eating and he's not rebuking them. And he's the Lord of the harvest. He's the one that knows the original intent, the original motivation of what the Sabbath is. So he points to a story and he says, you remember David? Oh yeah, David. We respect him. We don't respect you, Jesus, because they didn't see him as the Lord of the Sabbath or the Lord of the harvest. They didn't see him as Messiah. Remember that. And he said, yeah, yeah, David, King David. Yeah. Don't you remember the time that King David took his soldiers and when they were hungry, that they went to the, the granaries of the temple, which was consecrated grain, and he had them open up the granaries on the Sabbath and told his men to eat on the Sabbath? They said nothing because that was a true story and they all knew about it. See, the granary was just reserved for the priest and it was a holy and a special, only they can do anything with it. And, and so David said, open that thing up, which will been work. Prepare this and let's eat this for my soldiers. And they had nothing to say. Why? Because Jesus understood that the Sabbath was not existing just so men would have to keep a bunch of rules. But the Sabbath existed, listen to me, to ease the burdens of mankind. Think about that. The Sabbath existed to ease the burden of mankind in his relationship with God. I mean, think about Moses. Before he even got the Ten Commandments and they were written on, on stone, think about what was going on. The Egyptians were working like slaves and dogs. They were treated less than animals. They were dying under the heavy load and the hard work they were doing under the hot sun. And they were treated and just kicked out of the way when they died. And they, they had little to eat and they worked like crazy long hours of the day. God saw all that and when he delivered them, what did he do? In the desert, he says, that's not going to happen to you anymore. This burden will not happen to you anymore. You will take one day out of the week and you will rest because this will be no burden to you anymore. This thing of working seven days a week, this thing of working, 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 and, and you not resting. You don't have time to honor me. You don't have time to honor God. You, you, you're working, 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 working. I'm going to tell you something, that, that even today, even though the Jews celebrate the Sabbath from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, the premise of it all is, is that the Sabbath was, was established to ease the burden of God's people. But we today, many times, don't understand the benefits of it. We're going, that's the law. I don't have to keep that. Maybe we should think about the motivation behind the Sabbath and saying, maybe I'm burning myself out. Maybe I'm killing myself working too much. Maybe I don't give time to God. Maybe I don't work, worship the Lord. Maybe I, I don't keep God's things holy because I, I'm concerned only about myself. And in that case, you're going to be destroyed because your body wasn't made to work 365 days a year without some kind of rest. You got joints in your body and they wear out. How many know what I'm talking about? Football players only play a few years, but years later they can't hardly walk. Professional football. There are people on factory assembly lines that work with their hands and do things, and years later they can't hardly move their hands because of arthritis. There are people that breathe... That, 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 that do all type of things, you know, and it's a part of their work. It's a part of their livelihood. They get paid for. But the bottom line is this. Our body needs some type of rest. Let me hear what I'm saying. 
Did God make that original rule that you have? He, he gave it so that your life is not burdened, to take that burden off of you. But if we want to pile on the burden, if we want to pile stuff on the Sabbath, that's up to you. It's not a sin if you work on Sabbath, but God says, I've given you the Sabbath that you can keep it holy and have a time of ceasing from working. Come here, what I'm saying. It says in another place in Scripture that, hey, Paul writes, one day is no different than another. You can't call this day holy and that day not holy. See, the first day of the week, the eighth day, was the day that, that is believed to be celebrated by the early church that Christians came together and worshiped God together. They would break bread, they would hear the word, they would sing, they would worship together. There's all types of accounts and acts where the Christians were doing this on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. Just because they were keeping Sunday as a day of worship, does that mean they couldn't worship on Saturday? You know what? The seven-day events, Venice are, are, are bold, and they, and they will tell you that you must worship on Saturday. Right? How I many know seven-day Adventists? They, they'll argue with you. I don't have any argument with them. I believe you can worship on Saturday. I, I worship on Saturday. And I worship on Friday. And I worship on Thursday. And I worship on Wednesday. And I worship, how many get what I'm saying? I don't have an argument with them. I don't necessarily support the fact that's the only day because the Bible says we should worship God every day. Amen. Right? So that it's not a matter. I mean, the early church, if you wanted to designate a day, you'd find in Scripture that they designated Sunday. But there, there needed to be a time when the corporate came together and they broke bread and they, and they studied the Word and they encouraged each other and they loved on each other and they had this time together to promote the kingdom of God. Most of the time when people came together, guess what they did on the first day of the week? They didn't have church like we did. They, it was used as an evangelistic meeting. Did you know that? The early church took the opportunity of Sunday and used it for an evangelistic meeting. They invite people to their meals. They invite the hurting. They invite those that, 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 that were burdened down and, and they, they needed answers. They would invite them to be a part of their community. They study the word together and, and then they would minister and they would pray. They would eat and they would break bread and have communion. And through this ritual, through these things, which were good things, people came to know the Lord. So the first day of the week, understand this, the first day of the week, which is our Sunday, is basically, and I have no problem with this, represented as the time that Jesus rose from the dead, from the resurrection, and this is the time that Christians celebrate his resurrection is on a Sunday, and I think it's perfectly fine. But if you really want to get down to the brass tacks of it all, for the, early, for the early church and for us, we should be willing to worship God every day of the week, not just Sunday. So I don't have an article. I don't have an argument with the people that want to worship just on uh, that want to worship Saturday or Friday because I think we should worship. How many catch this? Okay. All right. So, so the coming together of the church in a corporate way is very, very important. The establishment of the church is to be the body of Christ that can accomplish things that a person on their individual self cannot do on their own. It's impossible for your new person in Christ to be discipled and mentored by yourself. There's just too much there. That's why God gave the fivefold ministry. The fivefold ministry was to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. When you read, and it talks about the fivefold ministry, the pastor's uh, prophets, evangelists, teachers, apostles, when they, when they talk about those, every one of these people have a part to play to mentor and to form and shape us into being effective Christians, productive Christians. You take out any one of these parts and we lose an edge. We lose the ability to be sharpened and mentored to function the way God wants us to. And this, this is totally sad because we're living in a day today 
that people don't believe in, in prophecy or the prophets. We're living in a day today where, where 75 to 80 percent is the last, last thing I heard. Do not even have revival. Don't have an evangelist. We're living in a time today that the teaching of what we've been taught can't sometimes be found in the Word of God. It's more of the teachings of self-help psychological teachings than it is the Bible itself. So what am I saying? That God is, is wanting to remind us that we must take a Sabbath. We must take a time to honor and reflect and cease. Don't you wish some days you said, that? I wish all the junk would just stop. Have I ever said that? I wish it would stop, especially if you have a bad week. Well, God says, you're right. I'll give you rest. I mean, imagine this, folks. I'm going to quit here just in a second. But in the Garden of Eden, God establishes this garden, and he creates man and woman, and they're to do what? Tend the garden. Shake your head. All right? However, they were always, they weren't worried about tending the garden. We worry about, let's get it plowed, let's get it hooked, let's get it watered, let's, get it, let's go pick it for it rocks on the vine. That didn't happen to them. See, they were in a good place. They were in a perfect place. They were meeting God every day. And, and what you find out when you read the scriptures, they were not working in the garden the way we think of work. They were just tending the garden. What do you mean? There weren't any rotten fruit. There weren't dis destructive squirrels and rabbits. There, just, the Bible, they didn't even break a sweat when they tended the garden. Because when you read the scripture, it was after the fall of man, after sin came into the world, after they broke what God said to, not to eat of the tree in the midst of the garden, that God says, from now on, you're going to sweat. And you're going to work hard, and you're going to scratch to barely make it, and when you do, and you work hard, and you sweat to death, then you're going to die, and you're going to go back into the ground. That's what God said was a result of sin. So imagine, when they were in the garden, they were at this place of rest. They were in this place of harmony with God. They didn't even sweat when they were doing stuff for God, not because they couldn't. It's they didn't have to. There was no sweat. But sin took away that fellowship. Sin took away that relationship, sin took away their complete rest in God. In the garden, they had rest in God. And sin took it away. Today, if you have sin in your life, it takes away your rest. It takes away your love. It takes away your hope. It takes away your life. Sin robs from you your joy. Sin robs from you your faith. Just like it did with Adam and Eve, the original sinners, it does the same for us. And they died and were banished from the garden because sin left them in a place with no rest. Now what the Pharisees did is they added all these laws to the original law of remember God and honor the Lord and it basically was forcing people to work their way to rest. If I just do this, I'll get rest. If I just do this, I'll be good enough. If I just do that, I'll get to this place with God. I mean, I'm talking about. Wait, you, can't do, you can't get to that place with God by working. There are people today that think that I didn't do enough for God, so I don't want to die right now. Because if I die right now, I'm not going to heaven. Listen, you're not going to heaven because you didn't do enough for God. If you, go, if you, if you, not, if you don't go to heaven, it's because you didn't do anything with Jesus. Not works, but believing upon him and receiving him in your heart and asking him to forgive your sins. How many know what I'm talking about? See, in here, we need rest. We need to cease from the work. But ever since the fall of man, it's been work, 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 work. And then Jesus comes that on the cross dies for us, pays the penalty for sin, that goes all the way back from the garden. And then Hebrews says that the Old Testament, the law was just a shadow and just a type of what was yet to come. The Old Testament 
said that if you do this, you'll rest. It was forcing people to do physical things so that they could maybe get physical rest, but they never had spiritual rest at all. I mean, let's face it, if I have a checklist of things to do today, I get them all done, I feel, oh, that's good, I feel good. But if I look at that checklist and I have 16 things to do and I got two of them marked off, I don't feel rested at all. I feel, oh, tomorrow's going to be more added to that. I mean, I'm talking about. So, so what happens is Jesus is our rest. He died on the cross to pay the penalty of sin that Adam and Eve forfeited. And they had no rest. They toiled by the sweat of their brows and they died and went back into the earth, which all of us that have ever died that end up going back into the dust. But then Jesus came and died and took away my sins and, and paid the price for my sins and died in my place on the cross so that he has now become my rest. I, the Ten Commandments are part of God's word, but what the Ten Commandments was pointing to, it was a shadow pointing to Jesus to come. It was a shadow pointing to Jesus to come. Jesus being the more complete. Be, Jesus being the more perfect. If, if I'm sitting here today, would you, would you rather, and, and, and Jesus was standing on this platform, would you rather be satisfied with standing looking at his shadow or looking at him? The Old Testament was the equivalent of looking at the shadow by the things that represented Christ. But I don't want to look at no shadow of anything. I want to look at my rest. I want to believe in my rest. I want to see my, I want to live. I want to love that person who's my rest, who's Jesus. So I'll bypass the shadow, thank you so much, and I'll go to Jesus and wrap my arms around him. I said, this is who I need. I don't need a bunch of laws to tell me to do things that, because I love Jesus and I'm not going to do those things. If you live by the law, you spend all your time worrying about which one you broke. That keeps you imperfect, that keeps you from ever being able to rest to ever think that you'll ever spend eternity with God. But if you live in Christ, you're free now. There's no condemnation in, the, in, in, the, in you. That, that God's not condemning you, but, but there is a freedom in Christ right now that Christ gives you the ability to have perfect rest right now. Your rest is not dependent on the check, how many things you check off. God wants you to have rest, yes. God wants you to have the son Jesus. All these good things that they did, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and all these things that they did that they pointed to and told the people to do, we should do those things. Those are good. Because the two greatest laws are love God. And then what? Love your neighbor. So the very rhythm of the Sabbath is loving God and honoring him and then turning around and loving our neighbor and honoring them. Jesus put it this way. Does the Sabbath exist that if I have a chance to do good, I do so? Or does the Sabbath exist that if I have a chance to do evil, that I do so? Obviously, what would you say? The Sabbath doesn't exist for me to do evil. The Sabbath doesn't exist for me to burden, be burdened down because they got all over Jesus because he was healing a man on the Sabbath with a withered hand. And then he asked them the question, see this man's hand? Would it bring glory? And would it be a good thing to heal him on the Sabbath or leave him like he is? You say it'll be work if I heal his hand. What does God say? What does God say to you today? It's not a matter if, if you work or if you don't work. We're not supposed to judge each other when it comes to that area because every man has to stand before God. But I would just tell you this, that, that, that even your bodies need rest. You can't go seven days a week indefinitely without having a problem. Come on, somebody. I'm going to finish with this story. How many give me another minute? I got to ask to see if you will. Anybody? Give me another minute. Okay, thank you. So there were these two woodsmen. There was this young woodsman, 
in his prime. You know, he's in his 20s, man, and he, he had this nice accent, you know, and, and he challenged the older woodsman to a contest. And the contest was to see how much wood a person could chop in one day to see who was the best woodsman. And the older woodsman said, okay. It was going to be a hard day, so they started early in the morning. And man, that guy went, the younger guy went out with a vengeance and started chopping and chopping and chopping and chopping. Then, then he would notice the older guy, he, t- he took a break about mid-morning. And he was just sitting there, he thought. He said, I got him now. I'm going to outwork him. So he had tried to outwork him, chopped and chopped and chopped and chopped. Then lunchtime came. So he gobbles down his lunch the younger woodsman, and he looks over there, and he sees the older woodsman, and he's just laying out all his food and everything, just taking his time. He says, this guy, I've got this made in the shade. So the rest of the day, they chopped, and they chopped, and they chopped, and and every so often, he look over there, and that guy be sitting again. He's saying, who does this guy think he is? He's never going to make it this way. Look at me. I'm working so hard. I'm going to win. All right? Finally, at the end of the day, they looked at each other, and the guy, the older guy, had a bigger stack of wood than the younger guy. And the younger guy was just hostile. He was mad about it because he was just a young buck. He's going, how could this be? I never stopped. I toiled. I worked. I never gave up. I never took time off like you. Every time I saw you, you were sitting there. How could this be? You have more wood cut than I did. He said, I wasn't just sitting there, brother. I was sharpening my axe. So he was beating down this tree with a dull axe. And the older guy was taking advantage and sitting there, resting his legs and sharpening his axe so he could be more effective when he did cut. Some of us are working ourselves to death with a dull axe. You're not as sharp as you need to be mentally. You're not as sharp as you need to be physically. And it looks like that extra money or that extra thing looks pretty good to you right now. Till you realize maybe someday it's going to take more than that money to get you back healthy again. It's not the fact that work isn't good. There's profit in all labor. It's that we can work smart and work the way God says. Or we can do it the way we want to do it. It's not a matter of heaven and hell. Because you're not working for your salvation. It's a matter of finding rest now in this world. Before you get to heaven. Some of you need rest. You're so worried. You're so uptight. You're... And I get it because there are things that don't turn out the way we want them to turn out. And and we think if we can work just a little harder, put a few more hours in, certainly, certainly something will happen. You know, I've really never met anybody that's done that over a long period of time that actually ever benefited without losing something they didn't want to lose. Be in a marriage, be their children be their health, something. They always lose something they don't want to lose when they dedicate themselves to the work. The Sabbath is a day to dedicate yourself to God and honor the Lord. If you have to work, it's not going to send you to hell. But we need to make our priority to honor the Lord and cease from work sometimes. Come on, shake your head. Sometimes. Sometimes. It's not for you to judge me or me to judge you if you're working. Because you'll stand before God and so will I. For the condition of our spiritual lives. For the things that we've done to honor the Lord or not honor the Lord. And God loves us so much. Listen, folks, he wants to give you rest. He wants to give you rest. How many believe that? Would you stand all over this place with me right now? I can tell you this, that the Holy Spirit wants to touch your life today 
and give you that rest, that peace that, that sin steals from you or that we forfeit just because we think one path is better than another and it's not. Some people here don't have rest because you're running from God. Other people here don't have rest because you're running from responsibilities in this world. Other people here don't have rest because you're not taking time to rest. It's not even a sin. It's just a choice. Can I encourage you, whoever you are, Jesus loves you. He gave his life so that you can have rest in him. And the Holy Spirit wants to help you today. It's not a testimony to the world to see Christians with nervous breakdowns and emotional problems just because things have ganged up on them, jumped all over them, and destroyed them. It's not a testimony for the Christian. But what is a testimony is when you go through a hard time and you go through things that are difficult and you, you don't like what you're going through, but you're going through them. Nobody, you didn't ask for them. They just happen. The, the pe- what's been said about you, what, what's happened, what's going on in the job, what's going on in your family. You didn't want it, but it's going on. And they watch you and they see how you live. They see how you talk. They see how you respond. And they see that you have peace in the midst of the storm. That speaks volumes to everybody around you. If you pick up the phone and call Jesus today, symbolically, he'll pick you be on the other line, he'll talk to you, be on the other side, talk to you. If you pick up the phone and call somebody to gripe and complain, that's about as far as you're gonna get. Why not call on the Lord today? Why not trust in Jesus today? Father, I pray for our church family, those who are here, those who are listening. The burdens have come on so hard. The struggles are sometimes more than we can bear. Some days we don't have answers for the hard questions. Some days we don't even understand the questions. I ask that you would move in a mighty way to help us to establish this rhythm of Sabbath. A time that we would cease work and honor you, love you, worship you. Thank you, Lord, that there's no condemnation in wanting to work. Thank you, Lord, that there's no condemnation. by over-worshiping you because there's no such thing. But today we rest in you. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Tony, you know, I've been going through my, I'm emotionally burnt. I'm burnt out. I'm, I just have, I don't, I just sometimes feel like giving up. Pray with the woman this week that had thoughts of suicide. The world just was caving in things going on in her body, the things going on in her life for so much, she just said, I, I just feel like I should end it all. Is it okay? And I sat and talked to her for a while on the phone, and I, I told her, I reminded her how much God loved her, and that was not going to solve anything. Maybe you're like that today. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, pray for me, I, I need that rest right now. I'm anxious, I'm worried, I'm depressed, I, I, don't, I don't know what to feel like. I need Jesus to intervene. Raise your hand real high. Come on, raise it up. Raise it up. Raise it up. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Raise your hand. Anybody else? Can I pray with you? Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, you see those hands? I pray right now that you just wrap your arms around them, that the power of your presence will make itself real, that there's perfect love and perfect peace in you. You'll help us walk through this world. You'll help us walk through these difficulties. You'll help us walk through these times of struggle 
We won't be exempted from these problems in this world, but we will walk through this world and we will make it through because you are there with us. You are the strength and the fortress of our lives. Holy Spirit, send the angels of God to strengthen and, and fight away those things that would try to destroy us, those negative feelings, those attacks, those fiery darts of the enemy. Move in a mighty, mighty way today, Lord. We pray the Holy Spirit would rain down on us today. Renew our strength as a wing of eagles. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let that person know today that's struggling with that financial need, that there's more than just the need for finances. There's a need to believe that God supplies all of our needs. Let that person today that's struggling and has no peace because their body's racked with pain know that there's something bigger than the pain in your body, and that is Jesus heals. He heals our bodies today. And I pray for you right now for your physical body. In the name of Jesus, our Lord who died on the cross for us, the blood of Jesus will be upon you now, breaking the stronghold, breaking the pain, breaking the, the disease and the illness off of your body. If we pronounce health in Jesus' name. Right now in your back, in the name of Jesus, Lord, send the fire into that back right now. Send a healing, holy fire into that back right now. Even now in your sinuses, let there be a come against infection in, in your head right now, in your sinuses, in Jesus' name. And the Holy Spirit touch you and strengthen and heal you right now. Thank you, Lord. Somebody here has a problem with their elbow. There's an elbow problem. It's in your left arm. In the name of Jesus, I pray that that calcium deposit that's in your elbow on your left arm go away. No more restrictions. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Come on, somebody pray. Somebody agree right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come against cataracts in Jesus' name. Be gone. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you. Thank you for the freedom that we have to agree together. We thank you today that we've come to encourage and lift up each other in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we pray, God, that you move in our lives and help us like never before to serve you with all of our hearts, to love you with all of our hearts, and to love each other as you love the church. We pray in Jesus' name and everybody say, Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. Give the Lord a hand as we dismiss today. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next time.